Hey everybody and welcome back to Jason's Wonderful World of Insightful Things. Today before us we have an M-Glow twin head compressor. Looks to me like it's about uh, 150 gallon or thereabouts. Um, the client called up and they said hey my compressor never stops. It keeps running. I think I got a system leak somewhere down line in the HVAC controls. So I came in, had a look, and just started getting into a menagerie of different things. Um, one of the things uh, that we found after investigation is this of two heads, this is head number two, could barely keep up with the demand and it couldn't go past 60 PSI uh, in the compression. So that being said, we started digging a little deeper and we found this compressor number one had snap piston shafts, uh, rings, and everything else. So if you take a look inside, you'll see the rods are completely missing off the crankshaft. So that's not good. So I reached out to the air compressor company in Youngstown, Ohio, and talked to Todd, my favorite specialist, and I said, hey, I need a, a Jenny Model W uh, replacement head. And then if it's feasible, I need a rebuild kit for compressor head number uh, two over here uh, so we could basically rebuild it uh, before it destroys itself. So today's episode, uh, I'm going to take this off. I've turned the power off at the disconnects, um, so there's nothing going to there. Um, I'm going to put this new replacement head on, which we have outside, uh, stored and ready to go. I'm going to basically scrap this head for parts. I'm going to rebuild that head back at the shop and this will be video part two uh, that we'll be able to show everybody. So without further ado, I'm going to start stripping this motor down and uh, we'll take this in stages.
So now that I got the new Model W Jenny head in for this air compressor, I'm just going to clean up some of this goo and get it ready for putting it all together. So as you can tell, I was able to get a lot of this stuff done in advance as far as the diagnostic for the head. So I'll show you, I will indulge you in this. This is what we'll get into in the next video. This is the top of the piston ring where the valves are. So as the pistons go up and down, these valves cycle to allow air to come in and compression to go out. And at this point, uh, they're pretty scorched. Um, it definitely looks like there was a lot of thermal damage in addition to friction damage. So when we take the other head apart at the shop, we will be rebuilding the good one. And depending on what I think of this, I may parts wash it and save these parts for a later date. <laughs> but as far as any hopes to rebuild the head, uh, those are pretty much done. Here's another example of some valves. They're so sticky, it's like having glue on these. So that's absolutely no good. And that's what a proper preventative maintenance uh, will do for us. So that being said, let's go ahead and pull up the motor. I'm not even gonna get into the safety aspect of how to lift. Oh. And we got one more nut. It's good. Two in, but apparently, if we use the magic number and putting it in the hardest place to access it would be the benefit. I have my ratchets and I went into my toolkit tonight and told my video helper, looks like I'm missing my 916s and 5.8 sockets, 716s. So, another thing I realized that didn't come in my kit that I'm sure falls on me is I forgot to get the replacement belts. That was always a problem. So I'm going to have to borrow these other belts on the working unit long enough to order four more new belts. Unless for some reason I can find them around the shop at this facility. A lot of times there's belts that the facility people catch. I see two belts up on top of the disconnect box that I hope those might be new belts, not old ones. But we'll find out here shortly. But I'm excited to get this head done, and I'll tell you why. Because with the other head that's on the right, the number two head, it wasn't holding pressure and it really ran the risk of conking out the complete HVAC chillers that are in this building. <laughs> and that is a problem. Okay, we're back. So we're in the phase right now of tightening up the belts, which isn't going well by hand. There is no belt tensioning system on this, which is typically a couple of threaded rods with some hex head nuts on the end of them, um, or some sort of uh, gizmo that they make so we can tighten these belts up to proper tolerance. So I did find a set of matching belts. They're not matched belts which is something we'll get into much later, but they are matching in size. So I thought about this and I says, I bet you I have a jack in my van 
that I can use as a tensioning device. And that's exactly what I found. So if you come around over here, this side, I'm able to fit this jack so coolly inside of this that I think it's going to work. So that being said, I mean, it's almost like somebody designed this thing to do this belt tensioning, which to me is just unbelievable. So I'm going to re-loosen the initial nut that I used to get this thing tight. I'm going to snug up the other nuts, and they are carriage bolts because they have a, a hex and or a smooth end, and they fit into a slide track. So that means I don't have to have a wrench on the back side of these. And then slowly but surely, step by step, inch by inch, I'm going to go ahead and start applying pressure to this to start the process of getting this belt tight. I'm usually going for nothing magical. I don't want anything too sloppy, so that's about an inch and a half or so of play. I want to get it to about within, I don't know, three-eighths of an inch, half-inch play, because um, if I don't, it's going to just screw up the belts, make slippage, make noise, glaze the pulleys, so on and so forth. So I've never done this before with this using a jack, but darn, it's working. Whenever you get the new stuff put on, there's always going to be stretching the belts. So you're going to have to come back every so often, a couple days, and check it in the proper lockout, tagout procedures so you don't get your fingers smushed in here. So with that said, now I'm going to tighten up my 916 nuts, get this thing locked down, and then we'll get it running. I got one pipe that I have to put on, and after that, we should be golden. So, good tool to have. And when I jacked up my truck when I had a flat tire with this thing, the jack was okay. <laughs> I think I damaged it, so I put a hydraulic piston back in the van and uh, had the opportunity to use that the other day. So this compressor needs some love, needs PM. This video, I'm not going to show you just that, because um, I don't have the time. It's uh, 9-22-2023, and that means it's a Friday. So my videographer, slash finance director, slash wife, slash good buddy is here and we could be not thinking and starting to drink but because this is so important for the client because their whole air conditioning system hinges on this and heating for that matter because they have pneumatic valves throughout the building for HVAC and for fire um, I thought it would be a good idea to get this thing put together as fast as possible And for those who know me, they know that I may have a vodka tonic in my future. <laughs> a double one at that. So, thank you Ford Motor. I hope you do well in your UAW strike. Uh, the jack was an absolute success. Don't let that out. Next piece I'm going to put on is the flexible copper compression airline. And what that's going to do for us is connect our compressor. So um, just so you know how it goes, in this case, this is stage one where my hand is. It compresses the air to a certain PSI. And then by virtue of this pipe, throws it into, or by virtue of one of these pipes, throws it into this head, which is stage two. And then after stage two, it goes right to the tank. So now what I have to do is find the missing fitting. So, I'll just put this here for the time being. That's my feed line for the compressor. That goes into the tank. And I'm going to have to take this other 
So I miss having my shop because I have vices and all kinds of things. I'm still getting more into the mobile service end of things. So as I do that, I get better and better each time at trying to figure out shortcuts or the right tools to get, so on and so forth. So that said, it's tough on tape time. I learned this trick from a plumber that if you are able to spin, get this deep into the threads first, and then flatten it out and walk over it like that, you'll have a much better connection with less leakage opportunity for leakage because you're not only getting the low trough part of the threads but you're getting the high contact point of the threads which is good to do so now i'm going to put this on the discharge side and so Keep in mind, you know, when you're doing this type of stuff, these things get super hot. And uh, the materials that you use have to reflect that, that heat. Let's see if I can get this to go around one more time. That looks pretty good. Okay, almost like it fit. All right, you for me. So I had to wrestle this thing a little bit. Although it is flexible copper, it doesn't like changes, and this was in a diff little bit different alignment than before. Bringing up the topic of alignment, there's a bunch of thoughts on the process of aligning these when you put them together, any motor, belt, shaft, pulley, spindle. And for this, I eyeball it. I look at how the belt wears in. I listen for noises and squeaks. I look for wobble. I look for belt uh, distension and all that kind of good stuff. But at the end of the day, I really haven't had a need to get into the heavy duty alignment of all this stuff. For whatever reason, it just usually tends to go pretty well. I had to loosen up this nut on the bottom quite a bit to give myself some slack. There is a back check valve on this, so even though there's pressure in this tank, I don't have to have it spilling out all over me because there's a clapper valve in there. 
it stops this from the air from coming out of the tank. If you guys are like me, I don't want to know the dark, dirty secrets behind the YouTube scene. <laughs> but when I watch other people's YouTubes, I'm the best armchair quarterback ever. My wife and I will watch stuff before we retire for the evening. And I'll be like, oh my god, that guy missed this. And can you believe that? He should have done this, that, and the other. So it would only be fair to assume that while I'm doing this stuff, I have a bunch of folks thinking of the same stuff. So that being said, we're coming down to the wire. Put it in the comments. Hmm? Put it in the comments. Yeah, put it in the comments, but make them invisible. <laughs> Sillies. I'm going to put the air filters in real quick. These are not the new ones that I got, but they're in the van. I don't feel like going outside just to see if this thing works right now. Um, so I'm going to use these ones real quick. Most is the media that's in it. This one is pretty good. All right. What do you think, Lori? I think you need a keyword for starting it. Yeah, I'm looking at the alignment. Seems okay. I hear air. We got oil because I can see it in the sight glass. Sight glass is right here. One word to the wise about sight glasses. I learned this a long time. Uh, sight glasses stain over time. And you're like, well, what do you mean? So as you use sight glasses, they get stained. Just like anything gets stained. The glassware at your house or what have you. So here's what I recommend everybody does. Get a bright light, your phone, whatever, and put that there and put it across and watch it as this thing is moving and make sure that you have the level. So the level right here is right here. You can see that. But sometimes like if you come over here, this one's already stained because it's way old. So the level's way high up here. It's almost to the top. But I've seen them where they get black and you think there's oil on them and there isn't. And that's what leads to a lot of, I would say, misdiagnosed daily and weekly inspections where people will come in and they'll think that, oh, yeah, I see oil, it's black, it's, it's ready to go, and it's not. So before I take this compressor off, okay, I'm going to turn this off on this. I'm going to turn, and here we go.
It's also pretty important that in the summer months in the high humidity areas of the world, you drain this up pretty quick uh, and make sure you do it daily. I don't know how much water's in here. I drained it once already. And it should have a collection system on it. This isn't set up right. At the end of the day, it's not all that bad. Pick this up. This was the head of the bad motor that I took apart earlier. Check this out. I adore the Indian culture from India on their ability to fix things, but I would be dead curious on how they would fix this uh, with these shit snapped uh, piston rods. So look at these pistons. So if you haven't seen the Indian folks uh, from India that fix stuff, and they have it to be very creative because they don't have the supply chain and the parts and the money that we have in the Western culture. They're absolutely fascinating. And I don't mean to just to say India from India, but it's basically, you know, the Middle Eastern area, everywhere that they have to make things work. So it's not specific to India, but I, I just happen to watch the YouTube channels and it's just fascinating as I'll get out. So I try to learn some That being said, what do you think, Corey? We're almost to 60 pounds. What do we want to get? I think we're going to get up to satisfaction. So our set point right here, once this compressor turns off, I'm going to take my sharpie and mark it. So we know that it's going to turn off at about <clears throat> 120 PSI. So now what I'm trying to calculate is what the low end uh, activation pressure is. So this is what I do because not only at a glance do I want to see what it is, but for the engineers that support the building and the maintenance folks, I think it's, you know, 
good for them to see that at a glance. I'm looking over here real quick. This doesn't look right. <laughs> This is way too much pressure. Way too much pressure. And that could be part and parcel. Why? This ain't working. One of the symptoms that the maintenance mechanic here at the facility said was this thing just runs and doesn't seem to be able to keep up with the building now. Usually building demand on, you know, the furthest point after, I'm sorry, before the regulator would be somewhere, you know, in the neighborhood of, you know, 100 pounds delivery, all that. So what I didn't like seeing was the fact that, you know, we're at 50 pounds. I think that's a bit extreme.
So it looks like we're getting some normal cycle. One of the things that I'm observing is the step down pressure regulator is taking tank pressure at between 90 and 120 pounds. It was up to 50 psi, and this pipe coming out is quite warm. So I'm wondering, it's starting to cause me some, some thought on, you know, how's this regulator uh, doing? What's the demand of the system? Will it work at 25 as good as it will work at 50? Um, that's what we have to balance. So um, the system is in weekend shutdown right now, and I'm going to have to wait for the engineer to come back um, to we can do this on the weekend and make sure everything is where it needs to be. So um, I'm going to take this one apart the exact same way I put this one together. Um, and in the next video, I'll see you back at the shop and I'll show you what it looks like to rebuild uh, the piston heads of this particular air compressor. So thanks for joining me. Uh, if you enjoy the content, hit the like button. You can even go as far as subscribe. Uh, it's been a little bit since I had some content on here. Uh, it's just crazy uh, starting up a new organization, um, but uh, we're out there, we're doing it, and I'm hoping to get more things for everybody to watch, and hopefully it helps your uh, job or your interests uh, equally uh, in the future. So, take care.